Good morning. Good morning. Everybody grab a cookie out there and stuff. We are glad, glad that you're here. Welcome to Edgewood, and we're here to praise the Lord. Um, Ronnie Harris is back with us. He's uh, continuing his series in Colossians, and we'll, after today, do two more. And uh, looking forward to that. I think next weekend is the ladies' retreat. So, guys, we're probably going to have to figure out how to hang out together, you know, and while, <laughs> while the gals are gone. But I want to mention there's a concert of prayer first Sunday uh, in May. Can you believe it's our, almost May? And uh, that's at 5 p.m. So uh, we're here to praise the Lord, and let's all stand together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name of God. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever be, we live for you. We live for you. Yeah. 
Just express in your heart how much you love the Lord. Just express your love to him right now. Lord, we love you. You are holy. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who can save. You are worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live. We live. We live. We surrender our lives each and every day. We want to live for you.
I could sing this song as I often do. And every song must Yeah. 
the children to go to children's church and uh, want to have the ushers come and uh, as we prepare to give our tithes and our offerings and let's pray Lord we why should I gain from your reward we cannot give an answer but this we know with all our hearts is that your wounds have paid our ransom and we are so so grateful this morning God so grateful, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done for us. We give back to you today and bless our tithes and our offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. I was going to have to carry this myself. Thank you for doing that. I thought maybe after a couple weeks, I was, you know, old, old, old hat now, so I got to pull it myself. Well, my name is Ronnie. For those that uh, I have not met yet, uh, thank you for having me. This is my uh, third week um, guest speaking, um, and appreciate being here. Love uh, 
talking about the Word of God and how it applies to our lives. And um, I'm going to start off this morning by just praying real quick. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for everyone in this room, Lord. Thank you for the history of this church, for brothers and sisters in Christ that have gone before us that established this uh, place of worship, uh, this place of fellowship. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless it. I pray that you would bless those that are in here today, those that are out elsewhere that call this home. And um, Lord, just thank you that you are in charge of the church and that you um, are doing your work in the world through the church. And um, praise God for uh, small churches, medium churches, and big churches, uh, because it takes it all, Lord, to reach the lost. And I pray that uh, um, our words this morning would honor you. Um, Just thank you for the talents and gifts and uh, of music and, and uh, organization and sound work and just all the people, the volunteers that um, make a uh, Sunday gathering happen and uh, be with us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So uh, we're in the book of Colossians, uh, and if you haven't uh, read Colossians yet, um, it's not too late. It's only four chapters, so you can make it up in no time. Uh, but it is a fantastic book of the Bible, one of the letters that Paul wrote to um, one of the churches that was started early uh, out of the book of Acts, um, we saw the start of the church, which we sitting right here uh, a few thousand years later uh, are the fruit of that. We are uh, the continuation of the church, local people gathering together in the name of Jesus, um, learning and growing, um, challenging, uh, carrying each other's burdens. And so um, I'm going to show real quick, um, there's a, an amazing video, again, if you haven't been here um, the BibleProject.com is a fantastic website. Um, Tim Mackey and his partner John, I can't remember John's last name, um, created the Bible Project, and they explain books of the Bible. They have topical themes that explains um, all kinds of stuff in the Bible. So we're going to um, show what we talked about last week and then what we're going to be talking about this week as well. So go ahead and roll that video. Paul's letter to the Colossians. It was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter is addressed to a group of people that Paul had never met who made up a church community that he didn't start. This church in Colossae was started by a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, who was actually from that city. And Epaphras had recently visited Paul in prison, and he updated him on how well the Colossians were doing overall, but he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address the issues that Epaphras had raised and then to challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. The letter's design and flow of thought are pretty easy to follow. The opening movement focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Paul then goes on to show how his suffering in prison is for the exalted Jesus. And then he addresses the pressures tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. After this, he explores the new way of life that Jesus' resurrection opened up for them. So the letter opens with two prayers. Paul first thanks God that he learned from Epaphras that the Colossians have been totally faithful to Jesus, showing love for God and their neighbors, all because of the hope they have in the new creation that Jesus has in store. And so he moves on to pray that they would grow in their wisdom and understanding about Jesus. And then Paul has placed a poem here to help the Colossians and us do exactly that. It's the centerpiece of chapter one, a poem all about the crucified and exalted Messiah. It has two parallel stanzas and it's crammed with language and imagery from the books of Genesis and Exodus, from the Psalms and the Proverbs. The first stanza explores how Jesus is the true image of God. In him, the full character and purpose of God is embodied in a human. He's the firstborn, an Old Testament phrase about Jesus' royal status over all creation. He shares in the very identity of the one true creator God. And by him, all reality, all powers and authorities, spiritual and human, have been created. It's in Jesus the Messiah that we discover the very author and king of creation. And so in the second stanza, we discover he's also the one bringing about a new creation. He's the head of a new body, which refers to Jesus' people, who are the new humanity, of which his own resurrection existence is a prototype. 
In him, God's glorious temple presence dwells. And so it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that God has reconciled himself to humanity, to all spiritual powers, to all of creation. It's a remarkable poem, and Paul will keep referring back to it as he goes on in the letter. So he first shows how the truth of this poem transforms his own experience of suffering in prison. He's being punished for announcing to the Greek and the Roman world that Jesus is the resurrected Lord and King of all. And so his suffering, he thinks, is not a sign of defeat. It's actually his way of participating in Jesus' own suffering done as an act of love. And so his hardships are actually a cause for joy. He's imprisoned for the surprising news that Israel's resurrected Messiah is creating a new multi-ethnic family. And more, just as the divine glory dwelt in Jesus, so Jesus dwells in and among his international family. Or as Paul says, the Messiah is in you you all the hope of glory. Paul then addresses the cultural pressures that are tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. They were confronted by a combination of mystical polytheism along with a pressure to observe the laws of the Torah. So all these new Christians, they had grown up worshiping the various Greek and Roman gods who governed different arenas of human life. And many simply included Jesus as one more deity that they could worship. There was also great pressure from the Jewish Christian community for these non-Jews to complete their commitment to the Messiah by following all of the laws found in the Torah. Specifically, he mentions eating a kosher diet, observing sacred days, and circumcision. It's very similar to the problem he addressed in the letter to the Galatians. For Paul, to give in to either of these temptations is compromise. It's a failure to grasp who Jesus really is and what he did on their behalf. The Colossians used to live in fear of spiritual powers and elemental spirits, as Paul calls them. But Jesus triumphed over these through his death and resurrection. He freed the Colossians from any obligation to them. In the same way, Jesus fulfilled on our behalf all of the laws of the Torah, which never had the power to transform the selfish human heart anyway. And so what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection, it lacks nothing. It doesn't need to be supplemented by following the laws. He is the reality to which all of the laws of the Torah were pointing anyway. Instead of the laws, followers of Jesus have the power of his resurrection to change them, which is what he goes on to explore. Okay, that's good. Following Jesus means joining... (laughs) Perfect. So um, last week we did chapter one through um, the first couple of verses in chapter two. This week we're going into chapter two. But um, Colossians is so good. We're doing only four weeks because there's four chapters, kind of made it easy like that. But um, th- it's so good because there's so much packed into this uh, book that really it could be preached on for, for quite a while. So I'm not doing it the full service, but I'm trying to do it my best service uh, for these four weeks. But as a reminder, last week, uh, Paul opened with a prayer of encouragement and thanksgiving. And that prayer is so powerful. Again, if you're uh, a a praying person at all, or if you uh, maybe want to uh, go deeper in your prayers or kind of expand your prayers beyond praying for the the food and that God would just protect you or something like that, uh, Paul's prayer covered uh, faith, hope, love, purpose, our task in life, our past, our present, our future, and the gospel, all in his opening prayer of encouragement. And then he talked about how Jesus is supreme. Jesus is above all. Everything was made for Jesus. Jesus made everything. And then uh, he talked about how the gospel needs to be contended for, like Paul is contending for the gospel, um, and he was suffering for it. And so, um, and he, he, he found joy in that. Uh, I was a youth pastor for a while, and we worked with this one group called Dare to Share, and uh, the leader of that group is a very passionate gospel pre- presenter in all circumstances of life, and he, he would teach us to teach our kids that, uh, you know, you just go to Persecution University, so Persecution U is what he called it. It's when you share the gospel with people, it's not always going to be received uh, as you would hope it would. On one hand, the, the gospel transforms lives just in and of itself, the word of God, and, and that can change somebody in an instant. But it also is uh, offensive to people because it exposes sin, and so then you're going to get pushback if you talk about the gospel um, to people that maybe uh, are not in a frame of uh, mind to hear it. And so, so that was last week. This week, Colossians 2, uh, 6 through 23 is the passage we're going to go through. I'm going to start reading. Uh, uh, again, it's really good stuff. Uh, verse 6, Therefore... 
as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through the faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, having having canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Then he set aside, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore... Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink and with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on aestheticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from which the whole body, nourished and knit together, through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. I feel like Paul has a lot of run-on sentences. These are long sentences. Verse 20, it, we're almost done. It, uh, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to its regulations? Don't handle, don't touch, uh, don't taste. Referring to all the things that, the, uh, that perished as they are used according to human precepts and teachings, These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and aestheticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Whew, that was a a mouthful. But so good. So good. And it's so cool because the big idea in in the book of Colossians, but certainly in this section, is that we are not to confuse religion, uh, the things that we can outwardly see, attendance by church or doing good deeds, uh, whatever you think of, uh, looking pious, praying a lot. Um, we're not to confuse religion with relationship. And Christianity is rooted in knowing and living out a relationship with Jesus alone. That is the big idea. A relationship with Jesus alone. This is what Paul is trying to get get through to the Colossians because, remember, there was deceptive stuff sneaking into the church. Of course, they were surrounded outside by a culture that was very polytheistic. Again, they just added Jesus to one more God that they were already kind of worshiping. And so Paul wrote this letter to warn them, to kind of steer them back. And it's great because the, uh, the five solas of the Protestant Reformation, if you might remember, our scripture alone, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, to the glory, glory of God alone. And so um, Colossians just really hammers home that it's our relationship with Christ. It's not what you're eating or not eating. Of course, in the Jewish tradition, they had a lot of rules uh, leading up to the time of Christ. And so he's referencing that stuff. Uh, but, but maybe even, uh, so this is, we're Baptists here, right? So I, I, my mom grew up Southern Baptist and you know, the, the, the joke phrase is don't drink, don't dance, don't smoke, don't have any fun. You know, and so Baptists, generally speaking, in the history of the denomination, you know, has been very conservative. And, and maybe there's times where either you've been like this or you've been around people that are like, uh, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Very, it feels very rules-based sometimes. God bless the Baptists. I'm, I'm, I'm down. Uh, my, my mother brought me to Christ. God used her to bring her to Christ. So, it, it, it's amazing that um, Paul is touching on the, the, the foundations of Christianity. So, what does it mean to be alive in Christ? Um, you know, 
it, it's sometimes easy to move past words or phrases, but, but the very start of this, uh, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, there's two foundational comment, uh, concepts right here in just this sentence, um, justification and sanctification. So, uh, as you receive Christ, so anybody who has received Christ, they decide to commit their life to Christ, Jesus becomes their Savior, right? You are saved. You're saved from your sin. You're saved from separation from God. You're saved from so much. Um, and that's what, how you receive Christ. And then it says, the Lord, it doesn't say Christ the Savior right here. It says Christ the Lord, so walk in him. So you're, received, uh, you're saved from stuff as you receive Christ, but then you are saved for stuff when you submit to the Lord and you walk in him. So you see two concepts, justification, just as if I'd never sinned. You can stand before God holy and blameless, not because of what you did, because of what Jesus did. That is justification. It's a beautiful thing. It's a gift from God. Sanctification is your growing journey in Jesus, in your life. And this is where it says, Christ the Lord, so walk in him. And so this is a powerful sentence. Just this one sentence right here is very, very powerful. I mean, this is the essence of the gospel because it it emphasized that you receive something from God. You didn't earn it. You didn't do anything. It wasn't my good deeds. It wasn't your good deeds. Um, God did something independent of us without us asking us about it, and despite our own sin, did it for us. He died for us. He reconciles us. He changes us. He reinstates us. He redeems us. He cleanses us. He forgives us. He loves us, and he pours grace on us. It's amazing. It's good news. That's why it's the gospel, the good news. You know, there's all kinds of good news out there, right? Um, I recently received some good news. I was given a job offer by a, a company, and um, I was happy about this news. This was good news. But it was based on the fact that I interviewed, and I had all this experience, and I could demonstrate examples of what I did. And so I earned this job offer. And um, Again, at my age, you're always happy to get a job offer. You know, if you've been in the workforce for a while, you kind of think, do they care what I think anymore? Um, and so that, that was good news. But the good news of Jesus is actually in some ways a little bit more difficult because it is offered without you earning it. And it's hard for us to divorce uh, us earning things and and feeling good about that, and somebody just giving us a gift. Like, if you get a gift on your birthday, you're like, okay, I was born, I earned it. But the gift from God, like, sometimes when you're given a gift from people, uh, it's kind of like hard. Sometimes, some people have a hard time receiving gifts. I mean, maybe there's some people in there. I don't, but some people don't. It's hard to receive gifts. And so it, it actually takes some humility it, it, and, and if you feel like that person has no obligation to give you anything, it's sometimes hard to take it. So if you think about the world and humanity and people that are out there and people that are going along and think they, their life is going well and, and they're independent and they're, they got everything going on, um, I, I, don't, I don't need anything. I, I'm good. And often it's a, t- it's a time of crisis in people's lives where they actually are open more to receiving the gift that is from God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is so fantastic. Uh, it's just the quintessential verse on us not earning it and it being a gift. Uh, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. Just make sure you know that. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So for those that have received Christ, this is exciting. This is life-changing. Uh, You've been justified before God. Your sin is not held against you. You died to your old life. You now can live a new life. And this is is amazing news. I actually uh, was at a men's breakfast yesterday. I heard a testimony of a a guy that, it's one of those testimonies that is just so uh, rough. Uh, I mean, drug addiction, uh, family, uh, 
family of origin problems. Uh, he fathered a daughter at a very young age, wasn't ready to be a dad. He was addicted to drugs himself. As his daughter grew up, he found out because he was kind of an absentee dad that his daughter was being um, sexually abused by a grandfather, and he had guilt over that, and he just did more drugs. And then he introduced his daughter to drugs once she got old enough uh, or when she, old enough, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. But once she got older, but literally the turning point in his life when his, was when his, uh, I think it was his 18-year-old daughter at the time, um, OD'd on heroin that he had given her in his house, and, and he found her unconscious. Um, she didn't die, um, but, but when, in his efforts to revive her, um, he... He turned to God at that point. And, and so listening to that story yesterday, I mean, like, I don't even know this guy. It's just uh, some guy that's up there talking at this breakfast. And, and I'm, I'm emotional. I have two daughters, so I, I couldn't imagine just a fraction of what he went through. And, and so if you think about a testimony like that, a life like that, his, his life has, was rock bottom, rock bottom. And so when you're given the gift of a creator that loves you, that you find out you have purpose, you have meaning, it is life changing. One of the questions to this guy after his testimony uh, was, uh, what about just like people that don't have like a dramatic testimony like that? Like what about all of us, you know, the rest of us type of deal? And, and he said, actually, you're in a worse position. He says, because you actually think life is good, you think uh, you can make it on your own, and that is in a worse position to actually be in a rock bottom place and realize that you cannot live on your own and you can 't do it on your own and it was a powerful statement it 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 it, it hit me well and so again the the good news of Jesus, the gospel, this gift of salvation is profound, so Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him so the Lord, again, different than the word Savior, both amazing words, but to be saved uh, from your past and then uh, the, to, to submit yourself to the Lord, again, that that that's, um, implies surrender, that, that re- implies relationship, that implies obedience. And so there, there is definitely something to this that, again, being saved is fantastic. It's a gift of God. You're, 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 you, you have a, a new life in front of you. But then there's something about us at that point that, that, that we respond to God and we um, change uh, our life. And so it's kind of like, what should I say? How should I act? What, what should I put my effort into? How should I treat others um, Sancti- this is sanctification. This is the process of being set apart by the Lord for his works, for his purposes, for his kingdom. And so hopefully you're feeling the tension here that, uh, because I think maybe we've all been there, for those that have given their life to Christ before, that, that, that you discover somewhere along the way that like, you know, it's maybe all your old habits aren't dropped right away. They're, they're difficult to drop. Maybe all your old friends aren't dropped. And so... Um, the question is, uh, yes, are, you're, you're saved, but are, is Jesus your Lord, and are you walking with him? And so the, the question is, what does walk with him look like? And it's, it's, uh, it's rocket science. No, it's not rocket science. It, it's as you would guess. It is daily, weekly, monthly, yearly spending time with God. I heard a fantastic testimony this morning. I was just talking to somebody in the hallway. Asked him how he came to Christ. He started reading the Bible. Profound. He started reading his own Bible. Somebody gave him a Bible, and he tried one time and then shut it because, like, he read some verse that didn't make sense to him, and then he shut it, put it away for a few more years, but then was challenged through some relationship, in a good way, through friendship and stuff, and just reading your Bible. It's, it's just showing up with God. That's walking with him. It's putting in the work. Again, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. You know, some people, uh, I, I've used this before where uh, how people, like, 
interact and, and view celebrities some, is, is a, how a lot of people actually treat God. And, and, and here, I'll give you an example. So I, I played in the NFL for a few years, and I played with some big names, right? Like, my name was not a big name. Um, my nickname when I got out of the NFL and I started my first job and I went through training, and they're like, wait, you played in the NFL? We've never even heard of you. And so then they nicknamed me Almost Famous. Um, so, but I played with some guys that, that, that you may know their names. One of them was Drew Bledsoe. He was the first-round pick out of Washington State. I mean, it was a long time ago, so if you're young, maybe you don't know Drew. But he was before Tom Brady. Everybody knows Tom Brady. Um, and Drew, uh, you know, there's people that know everything about Drew. They know all his stats, all his big games, you know, about his college uh, career, his pro career. Um, but they, they've never met Drew. They don't know Drew. They just know about Drew. And then there's people maybe like me that, like, I know Drew. Like, I was teammates with Drew. I, I, I was friends with him. Uh, I've, I've ridden in his car. His, he was so excited. He got a Porsche one day, and he was like, Ronnie, you want to go for a ride in my new car? And I'm like, yeah, let's go ride in your new Porsche. And, and he's like, well, I thought I'd go Porsche because that's more everyday. Ferrari's kind of a little bit, you know, too. Uh, so... <laughs> I was like, yeah, I get it. Um, but I'm friends with Drew. Now, I don't live in the same city as Drew, and I don't talk to Drew all the time. Uh, I don't call him up. Um, I have, I, I've emailed him a couple times. Uh, I've run into him, and when, it, when we see each other, it's like, you know, we, like, give each other a high five or a hug, and we talk about the good old days and the one pass I caught from him. I, we don't talk about that, actually. <laughs> um, but it was really cool, actually. My, who at the time was going to be my future son-in-law, was going to propose to my daughter, and this was going to happen at a Washington State football game because my daughter was working for the university while she was going there. And we actually had the privilege, my wife and I and my daughter, to tag along with my future son-in-law to while he was going to propose. And so we snuck up to the suite level, because that's where my daughter was, and then we had to hide in one of the suites before we went down to surprise we, like I'm doing this, my, my son-in-law was going to do it, but I was tagging along, and we went into the seat, and there's Drew. And it's like, hey, hey, Drew. And, and then so he got to talk to my son-in-law. I was like, are you ready to marry the, Ronnie's daughter? You know, and it was great. But there's people out there that God, they know about God. Maybe they grew up in church. Maybe they just read some stuff. Maybe they've talked to some people that uh, call themselves Christians. They know about God, but they don't have a relationship with him. They don't really know God. And then there's people that would say, like, yeah, I, I'm a Christian. Uh, I, I know God. Like, I gave my life to God. Um, but, but it's kind of like me and Drew. It's like, hey, we see each other once in a while, every few months or every, every couple years. We run into each other. We cross paths. Um, but God wants a relationship with us that is like best friends. God wants us to walk with him, right? There's, there's actually three. Three guys that I walk with. One's, one's right here, Mark. Mark, go ahead, wave everybody. Mark, Mark is one of my longtime friends, and, and we walk with each other, meaning that we talk all the time. Like one of the first guys I call uh, about life's highs, lows, everything. Um, and then I got a, a buddy in Alabama who is uh, a longtime mentor of mine that when I played college football, he was the Bible study guy for the athletes. And then my brother, those three guys, uh, I walk with those guys. And, and that, what that looks like, again, is that we know each other. We share life together. Um, we know what's bugging us. We, we bug each other. Um, it, it, it's the frequency and the regularity of relationship and conversation. This is what God wants with you. This is what God wants with you. Not only to walk with him, but all these things you see up on the screen here, uh, to be rooted in him. Roots go deep. To be established in faith, to be built up, to be taught. So we're always to be learning, to hold fast to Jesus. 
You know, I like that, I like that term hold fast because what, what that means to me um, is that when I'm faced with cultural pressure to compromise my thoughts, my beliefs, my actions, my default is always going to be to go back to the Word of God and be like, okay, how does this, how does this jive with the Word of God? And if I don't understand something about the Word of God, I always give God the benefit of the doubt. Like, the, the not understanding part is on me. It's not on God. It's up to me to talk to some buddies, call some people, hey, what does this mean? And uh, it, that's what holding fast is to God. I, I, I had a kid in my youth group years ago. Uh, I, I conducted his wedding. Um, I felt close to him, uh, obviously, like, like you do when you journey with people for a while. And then um, after he was married for a few years, I did another wedding up near where he lived. And I hadn't seen him for a while, so I called him up and popped in and said hi. And, and I just was, like, talking. And I'm like, oh, where are you and your wife going to church? And he's like, oh, yeah, I don't believe in God. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, whatever, dude. Like, wh- where are you going to church, for real? He's like, no, seriously, I, I don't believe in God anymore. And I'm like, what? And he had, like, a, what happens a lot of times to people in their, like, late teens, early 20s, they're exposed to the world in a new way, whether it's be college or, or whatever, new experiences, new places. And, and all of a sudden they're like, wait, there's, there's, there's something else out there. There's competing ideas. And, and, and the competing ideas grabbed him. And, and, they, and they, they have temporarily, is my prayer, that, that God will uh, pull him back in. But we are to hold fast to Jesus because there are competing ideas out there. We're to nourish ourselves. And again, so showing up, uh, again, you guys showed up today. I don't know why, but you did. Maybe you, you, for your own reasons. Uh, and... and there are probably a lot of different reasons why you showed up. But I believe every time you show up, it's the providence of God. It's, it's God drawing you to him. And, and again, uh, it's all about a relationship with Jesus, so it's not about how many times do you go to church. But in my experience, if you go to church and you hear the word of God being preached and you worship God in, in song and in word and then you fellowship with other Christians, I mean, this is, this is building your faith. This is growing in your faith. This is what... We're supposed to be doing. This is walking with him. So we need each other in this journey. Uh, 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 The hold fast is followed by the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments and grows with a growth that is from God. We need each other. The body has many parts and all parts are needed. Except the appendix. You don't need that. So don't be like an appendix. No, I... But to sharpen each other, to encourage one another, to pray for another, to carry one another's burdens, the Christian life is meant to be vertical with Jesus and horizontal with each other. Kind of makes a cross, too. So right in the middle of uh, this passage, just like in chapter 1, there's like this nugget of theology. It's like a Cadbury egg. Does they still make Cadbury eggs? You open it up and there's all that stuff in the middle. We, we have to just reread this because, again, this is why Paul wrote the letter, to remind the Colossians the most important thing. Like, what you believe determines your actions. And so believing the, the right view of Jesus is important. So that's why a lot of this is said multiple times in the first two chapters For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you... These were the two verses for Easter that we uh, looked at. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your heart, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them open to open shame, triumphing over them. This is why... um, 
Jesus is the only way. Uh, you probably have had friends, and maybe you've been this person at one point in your life, um, that you hear people say that, um, you know, kind of all roads of God, like, lead to God, like all spiritual paths. You know, everyone just calls them by a different name, depending on where you grew up and stuff like that. But, but it's not true. It's not true. Uh, Jesus is unique. His claims are unique, and he backed those claims up. And so Jesus is God. He fills us up. He cuts away our old self. And then this beautiful picture of baptism by immersion, where we're, we, uh, our old life is, is washed away, our sins are washed away, and then we're ro- rose to a new life in Christ. It is very good news. At the end uh, of the chapter 2, we have a few warnings, a few warnings. One is uh, to not be taken captive by philosophy or by empty deceit according to human tradition. So this you could think of stuff that, you know, most, mostly would be outside of church. Um, I certainly these, these things can infiltrate the church, but um, some of them are a little bit more obvious than others. Um, I, I had another gal uh, in youth group that, um, she went through some traumatic stuff, and so she j- kind of like walked away and, and was really lost as an individual because she had some trauma done to her. And then she, I ran into her a few years later, and she was all excited because she was doing so well. And then she sent me the link of a person that like had helped change, and it was, it was like a, I would say it was just an American shaman. It was, a, it was a gal that was like basically sold a philosophy of how to be a better you. And it, and it helped her, uh, at least temporarily, get her out of her, her place. But, but it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't Jesus. Um, and, and, and so we need to be wary of uh, things and philosophies and life. Um, it's really funny. The last couple months I've traveled twice to Colorado to um, visit my father-in-law, my wife and I did because he had surgery on his back and um, had a long recovery. And so waiting in line, I don't know if you guys do this, but uh, when, when you're in like the security line, Denver had the longest security line I'd ever been in my life. It was, it was crazy. And so it was, it, was, it was 47 minutes of just like walking all around the Denver airport and then eventually we, we went in. And, but so I started talking to this gal behind my wife and I and, and uh, you know, by the time we were done talking, she was, you know, talking about the shroom, you know, her shrooms. She only does stuff that's grown out of the ground. That was, like, safer to her and just, you know, the, the joy it brought her. And then the last time I got stuck in the car rental place and a guy had, he was from Yugoslavia and he had been through the war when he was, like, 8 to 13 years old. And so he said he had a lot of trauma in his life. And so he found this light therapy um, and... I don't even know, it's not a tanning bed, but it's like light therapy. I wound up looking it up, and it was very new age. So again, like, you talk to people out there just in the public, and you're going to get all kinds of stories of things that are, like, filling people's voids in their life. And and the the, the sad thing is is things like that are, are, are temporary, I actually asked him, I'm like, hey, did the light therapy last? Like, was it just like a momentary thing or did it last? And he was like, well, it lasted until I smoked a lot of weed and that just messed it up. And so <laughs> those are his words verbatim. And so you're going to hear out there so many different strategies to feel better. Um, but but they're, they're temporary and they're, they're false and they're, they're based on human tradition. And then we're, we're to um, not let anybody disqualify us based on religious-looking things that you're doing or not doing. And this is important inside the church sometimes because depending on, uh, you know, different church settings you maybe been in and stuff, um, you know, there, there's some people that look really spiritual and that, um, that maybe they, they, they say a lot, of thing, a lot of times, like, God told them this, God told them that, and, and, and there's, there's like this... It's, it's like a modern-day Gnosticism of, like, a higher knowledge. And then, then all of a sudden you're like, well, hey, I'm not having these spiritual experiences. And then if you really start talking to them, they're like, well, have you surrendered fully to God? And do you have sin in your life? And, and it's like they take stuff that's, that's 
good foundational stuff that, like, we need to examine our lives, and, and, we, and I want to be connected to God as much as everybody else, but we got to be careful with um, the origins of some of these very spiritual experiences that you may find even within the church. And so we're to beware. We're to, um, so if you're doing something or not doing something and you're getting criticized for it, again, Scripture is our basis. This is what God's word to us. And again, as a reminder, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 is a fantastic uh, couple verses where it's just as a reminder. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son who he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. So again, your relationship with Jesus is the most important thing, and you can find all about that in God's word. Um, you, don't, you don't need extra revelation that's outside of the Bible. Um, and so we're to beware of things that uh, come, come across us. And then finally it says, be aware of indulgence of the flesh. Um, it's always, it's always lurking. James 1, 15, I, I, I quoted this verse last week. After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Our desires are not bad. God gave us desires. We desire to be loved, to be known, and, and to know, uh, and to love, and, and that, those aren't, that's not a bad desire. But it's when the object of our desires are outside of what God would have for us, what God says, hey, I designed you this way. This is, this is how life flourishes. This is how you can be blessed. And when we go outside of that, that's when uh, it gives birth to sin and sin gives birth to death. And that's, um, you know, much of uh, the popular culture that sounds good but ultimately is going to lead you to a place um, of pain. And so our number one object of desire for love, for connection, for salvation, for healing, for comfort, for strength, for courage, needs to be Jesus. And as long as everything else is submitting to that, then you're in a good spot. You're in a good spot. And so, as a reminder today, don't confuse religion with relationship. Christianity is rooted in knowing and living out a relationship with Jesus with no other add-ons. That's what Paul was telling the church of Colossae a couple thousand years ago and what he's telling us today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much that we can can always come to you, certainly in prayer and in conversation. Um, We can always get... uh, godly advice from other people that love you that we're in relationship with. But Lord, thank you that we have a foundation of your word that that is timeless, that doesn't change, and that is relevant. Your word is so powerful, as was testified this morning, by reading your word, your Holy Spirit illuminates, and we can discover what it is to have a life not just saved from a few things here on earth and maybe an insurance policy for when we die, but we can have you as our Lord and we can walk with you daily and that by that you sanctify us, you change us, you mold us And so then life becomes about how we can be a part of your kingdom as opposed to you being a part of our world. And Lord, I just thank you for that gift that you give us. The gift that maybe sometimes is hard to accept for people that life's kind of going pretty good. Lord, help us to recognize that no matter where we are, no matter what kind of security we think we have, that We need you, and that life is in you, life was made by you, and we have life because of you. And so, Lord, help us to tap into that. Help us to understand what that means for each and every one of us today, tomorrow, and the next day.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together. In this time of desperation When all we know is down and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe Thank you for this day, Lord. This is a day you've made, and we cast our hope on you, the author, finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Go with us now in Jesus' name. Amen.